So I sat there and I think I was chatting with a family group. So I was telling them, I'm here, you know, and I was chatting and then some guy taps me from the back. Touch. He actually touched me. So I I look back and he goes, you type very fast. So I'm like, yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm still typing. I'm still typing. And then he says, wow. Gosh. And then there were different conversations. So I said writing. So basically I said writing what was going on. So I said writing. I'm here. Some guy just tapped me. And it was at that moment. So I brought out my small book. Okay. And I just said, crafting what was happening. And I said, Kenny, you have so many stories. You love to write. You love to read. Mm. You used to write when you're younger. So I didn't call it HR Storyteller. It's just storyteller was named by other people. My father told me life is not a bit. This is Origins Africa Podcast, where we explore the origin stories of people who have made and are making their dreams come true. Asking the what, the when, the how, and the why. I'm Oshaye, and on this episode, the concluding part of our chat with Kemi Shinobi, we explore Kemi's defining moments in her first HR executive role, her career mistakes and lessons, as well as her career progression up to her current role as the Director of People, Culture, Experience and Operations at TVC Communications. You'll also get to hear how the HR Storyteller platform was birthed a platform oriented towards transforming the HR practice and workplace cultures with the art and power of storytelling. Over the last episode, we talked about Kemi's growing up years in the North, the different career options she explored before finally settling on accounting in the university, as well as the defining moment of losing her mom while in school. So my mother and I were very close. I, I kept referring to that when we were talking. And um, it was like the person who had built me to do everything just left. We also talked about Kemi starting her career as a customer care officer in Airtel, then Econet, right after a national service year. A subsequent transfer to the training and development department and her picking up her first official HR leadership role at Venture Garden Group in 2011. Funny enough, there were no fears then. So I remember that when we were on the trip and I was just feeling, you know, my dad had died. Um, I wasn't enjoying, I wasn't getting joy from work. It was that uncertainty hanging. I remember my husband and my husband has been, he is my number one cheerleader. So he's that person that, there's nothing. Mm. And and, and I think that's one of the things that, okay, you're feeling bad. He he just sort of tells you how you should feel or how you will feel. Sometimes I tell him that I think he has, I don't know, maybe he has a crystal ball. But so he told me on that trip, he said, he, he believes that we were at the, edge of me transitioning so when that thing was happening it was like an affirmation i was just accepting it that okay kemi you've done the work you've built competency it's a new terrain in terms of title but this actually is time and it just fit like a glove okay so i won't call it fear the only thing I knew was, okay, now you need to get more competent. Okay. And competency is upskilling. Okay. Testing the knowledge that you have. Okay, this knowledge. I need to now join networks that were HR networks. I need to just be sure that this that I'm doing is actually recognized. Now, as Kemi continues her urgent story on this episode, you'd particularly hear how important it is to have a loving and supportive partner and people with you on your journey. People who, especially in your low moments, remind you of who you are and achievements you've recorded. Kemi particularly had that in her husband, Dikbo Shonubi, as she went through her career journey at the workplace and the challenges it came with. But let's get back to the story. 
Recall that prior accepting the HRL Adventure Garden Group, Kemi had not been exactly clear on what she wanted to do yet. She was simply being open-minded and giving her best in whatever role she found herself. So curiously, at what point while leading the HR function at Venture Garden Group, her first official HR experience did Kemi realize that HR was it for her? Was it more of a growing realization or was there a defining moment? I'm trying to. There were, there were many. Okay. It's not like, oh, one morning, morning I just woke up and said, ah, no. Um, okay. It grew on me. Okay. But it was a reaffirmation okay. from my interactions with people that I knew what I was doing. Okay. Um, people listened. I understood what it meant. And it's not just about, oh, you know how some people say, HR is about liking people. No, no, no. It's not that. It's, yes, I've always liked to meet people, interact with people, but that your role had an influence is an automatic role in the organization, if used properly, to influence both leaders, top level, mid level, and every other person. So it felt like you were a doctor. A doctor who people could come talk to. A doctor who could almost see before they come to talk to you. A doctor who could connect the different buckets of HR to solve the organization's problem. So it was all of that together that reaffirmed that everything else I'd been doing was building up to this mm. moment. Okay. So it almost seemed like I had even been practicing HR years before, but maybe I didn't have a nomenclature attached. Okay. But so it was a reaffirmation that you're doing what you're doing. You're impacting. You stand up in front of people. You can talk confidently. You can leverage on your inbuilt skills, which have also grown over the years. You're hearing feedback. You're doing very well. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was your first HR experience? officially or formally, were there any embarrassing first efforts? Hmm. Embarrassing first efforts. So early on, I knew that um, because I, I was thrust into, I won't use thrust, maybe not thrust, but this was a role I was playing and I was going to do very well in it. I had mentors. I'd already surrounded myself with people that were there before me. Okay. Who maybe had started a few years before me. Okay. What do I need to look out for? So I always bounce, you know, ask questions. If I'm thrown with a scenario and even I do it today. So if you see, my CEO tells me we need to do this. Of course, now maybe I have experience some of those things so I can give you a spot, you know, on the spot answer. But even the on the spot answer, I would typically say, could you give me, um, let me come back to you because with HR, there are actually different perspectives you need to take into account. So I wouldn't say that anything stands out as an embarrassing moment. Um, at board meetings or meetings or management meetings, I usually watch the room. Okay. I will take note of what is being said and what's not being said and build on that. I do believe that, you know, when you see people nodding, smiling in the rooms, it means you're making sense. I'll research anything to the T. So even if I have not practiced it before, I, can, I have a reference point from things I've observed, things I've seen work elsewhere, and I could speak to that. It wasn't that I was going and reading on Google. No, I was speaking from experiences I'd say, you know, experience as a person, as on the other side of being HR or not being HR, experiences of other HR people. And I was also building with the company. So I wasn't necessarily bringing experience from one company to try out here. It was what should work here? What does the principal want? What's best practice? So being able to balance that helped me a lot. What were some of your mistakes 
Even then now you would say have become lessons learned. Generally or at that time? At that time. Um at that time I think even though I don't think, you know, um it's turned out bad. You know, when I reflect, I just feel that there's some things I could have done differently. There's some relationships I may have not attempted to have. Mm. Um, I There's some things maybe I should have not even tried. I should just, you know, but on the flip side, you know, and recently I was just thinking about that generally that I don't like seeing things as mistakes, even though that's recent. Before, if you had asked me this question, I would say, ah, you know, but I have come to appreciate that some things that felt like they were mistakes actually were positioning you for something else. If you had asked me six years ago, I may have been able to say it was a mistake, but now, over time, I have seen that those things connect to what I'm doing maybe today. Mm-hmm. That experience, that exposure is helping me in a particular space. So um, maybe a mistake or two would be at that time, maybe at a meeting, um, not interpreting the room properly. Mm. And maybe speaking or speaking too hurriedly. How do you mean? So, um, not taking the whole picture into account or what is being said and being quick to want to offer suggestions or recommendations or solutions without seeing the big picture. I'm not using this example, you know, you're at a meeting and you already have your answers, but you've not gotten the full picture of what is being discussed. Um, so you go back and you're like, hmm, I missed, I missed that, you know. But once again, fantastic spouse, um, good mentors who are always bounce questions off, open conversations with both um, the CEO, you know, and the partner then, partners we had. So I also met Demola, the three. I had already been interviewed, onboarded before I met Demola. And so there were three different Arometa kind of relationship. <laughs> um, so mistakes. Of course, there are times when, I, okay, one now comes to me. Um, some conversations that were had via email. There's a lot of back and forth, back and forth. It was like between you and them. No, there were different people in okay. the organization. Um, I remember there was some conversation with the finance person, the finance team lead then at some point um, that could have been handled a bit differently. Um, There were no points to prove in the email. Um, I know there was a business development person too in the company at some point too. So my point is, over time you now realize that there are some conversations you can just have with the person physically Sorry to okay. cut in. So was it your mistake or was that you learned from their mistakes and drew a lesson from it? I think the mistake I would say for me is okay. even though it was a learning. Okay. At that point, I was doing my job okay. as best as I, I knew how. Um, there was a conflict of... of um, perspective okay and now that type of conflict i would not resolve it the way i resolved it then i'll resolve it differently and i'm talking about relationship management do you want to go into details being okay so um this one is even very funny i think we're we're meant to buy rice okay for end of year okay for company and typically before I joined, this firm or these individuals were the ones I used to do the rice buying. So, you know, it is nice business. They are doing by the side business. 
So here I came with my own contacts, vendors, and then his HR. You know, so these things were supposedly under my purview. And I think we're able to get a different brand. So the brand that these guys had supplied previously was a bit somewhat different brand. I don't use, but we could get better okay. and at a decent price. Okay. So there was a lot of, no, we should use this vendor. No, we shouldn't use this vendor. Why should we use this vendor? And then the emails kept building back and forth. We were doing this before you came back oh. and forth. And then I was responding, the kind of rice, the ones they brought, there were this value, there was this, you know. So things like that. It was not tough. It, I wouldn't say it was a tough war. Tough, as in, you know, you're fighting for your own turf. No. But with age, with knowledge, with understanding the dynamics of an organization, if that kind of thing comes up now, the different ways to handle it. Um, in retrospect also, there are one or two conversations that I could have handled differently, even with my CEO then. Um, but um, I, I think, you know, when your emotions rule, and then I, I give a lot to the company in terms of time, in terms of growth, in terms of everything. So there are times when I felt like, ah, this is, you know, it's Tiwan Tiwa kind of thing. And um, so there were times when I would speak from emotions rather than maybe removing myself, which was tough because this was, this was like my baby, uh, rather than distancing myself and maybe... But was it wrong for you to feel like it was your baby? I don't think it was wrong, which is why I said, you know, when you ask a question about mistake, you know, I, I look back and, okay, maybe if this was happening now, I'll be handling it differently. Okay. Maybe I'm having the conversation differently. Maybe I may not have even stayed as long as I did. Mm. But it's not wrong. <clears throat> Especially at that phase that the company was. And by nature. So the thing is, I've not really changed that much. <laughs> but what I mean is, by nature, I take things serious. Um... You give me something, I don't just want to give it back to you the way you gave me, you know, the story of talent. I want to give, I want to build it. I want to groom it. I'm happy that it's grown. Now, growth is relative. Growth is not in numbers alone. Growth is in breadth, in quality, in impact. So that's the kind of person I am. So I won't say that I've changed largely. Anywhere I find myself, I want to grow, but... I have been able to identify my pet peeves, you know. I've been able to identify things that I'm very passionate about or I've been able to qualify my value system. So when there's a clash of values, which is not so much that the individual is bad, no. but there may be, in the, you're not as aligned as you were before I have, I identify that better now. After six years, you decided to leave. Mm -hmm. um, at what point did you think that it was time to go? Or what happened? Um, it was not too also long. Also because yeah. like you said, it was your baby. It was our theme. And you had been there through the early years, through growth, mm, mm, spent mm. six years. At what point did you think that? I realized both of us, when I say both of us, me as an employee, me as the lead HR function, and the um, leadership of the company, they just seemed to be, we're no more, we were no more tangoing as well as we used to. We had gotten to a point where it was seeming like our values, maybe will values be the word, were no more in alignment. There were more differing opinions. 
on the company, the brand, and um, and how we were moving forward. So, like I said, in retrospect, when you think about some conversations, maybe you could have had a conversation or two differently. Maybe you could have said something differently. Um, passion. I was very passionate about my role in the company. Um, but I think it was just, you know, when sometimes your legs, like for me, my feet moved after childbirth. <laughs> You know, they moved a bit. So the size I used to wear before I had my child. Are you serious? Yeah. Okay. It happens. So I think it moved. I think I, you know, the fit, it, it wasn't a perfect fit anymore. And it was time to move. Okay. So. And um, did you have another opportunity then? Or so, okay. Let me let you finish. Oh, yeah. Um, no. When I say opportunity, not a job. Yeah. There was no job waiting for me. But I already, once again, from a very young age, there's always the other side. What else are you doing to gather to gain income for yourself? So I had that. I still was training. I was still called upon from time to time to come facilitate a retreat, strategy session. Um, then I, used, I, I, was, I am very passionate about young people. So um, around that time, I started partnering with Lagos State. There was this project that they were working on and it was beautiful. It was one of my best highs. Um, young people who are coming into the workforce, getting them ready for the workplace. So yes, there was no job waiting, but I already knew that it was not going to take long before. Okay. I, I you move. got another job. I get another job. Okay. I also wanted to breathe. Okay. Because even though it was six years in that company, it almost felt like 60 years uh -huh. because every day was heavy, energy, new thing. And that's one beautiful thing about startups. Startups, especially in the startup phase, when it balances, it may not be as hot. There's now more structure, you know, but the startup phase is exciting. Your yesterday, today, not necessarily the same. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And how long before, you, uh, between when you left VGG and you got another job? Um, I got, I started my new job in um, 2018, about February. So about a year? Yeah. So it was a gap year, they call those kind of things. When you go on holiday with yourself. Um, knocking on the door of a year, maybe okay. thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah, thereabouts. Through those 12 months, how, should I say, what was your emotional state? Or... Oh, wow. Um, I was engaged okay. with other things, um, reading, walking, side gigs, um, things I was passionate about. Then I started interviewing, I started having conversations. Oh, I did a lot of conferences to attend it. You know, and, and it was fun. Where are you now? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the lookout. Mm. Even I had cards printed, just my name. Interesting. I did. <laughs> um, it just had commission to be HR professional. Interesting. Yes. Um, Why did you feel the need to make cards? I was going out. Okay. I was going to network. I'm going to be at events. I remember I was at an event with, um, was a um, Dane Carnegie, Dale Carnegie. Carnegie and Carnegie, I always pronounce yeah. it. Um, event, you know, you're going to meet people of your okay. your peers. You're going to meet other people. Um, and at that level that I attained, just say, oh. I see. It didn't, okay. it, it, you know, so it positioning also. Okay. Um, and then I was very upfront. Oh, okay. I knew you from VGD. Yes, I've left them. I'm in my gap year. I used to joke about it. So what do you want? I'm like looking at new opportunities, maybe a different industry. Mm. Um, so my card will come out. I say I have copies. Because it was, I did not want to feel there was, there was nothing wrong with not being at a job. There was nothing wrong with resting. Mm. But I didn't want to create the impression that I'm, I'm going on holiday. No, I wasn't going on holiday. I was just taking time out to look for the next best thing. 
to look, look for the next challenge. So I want to be prepared and presenting myself like that. Okay. So that was it. Okay. Mm. Um, but the next opportunity was at um, Gig, I think. So I, <laughs> I went on to work with GIJ. Okay. And um, that was exciting to me because, in fact, before GIJ, so I'd interviewed with different companies. Um, some had given me offers, some good brands, big brands. Um, I interviewed with um, ARM. I wanted ARM. I liked it. It looked like a nice brand, <laughs> you know. Um, but we didn't get ARM. We got to the final stage, you know, did everything. But it was a, they have, it's almost like bank, where they have criteria, um, total types of years of, experience okay. number of years okay. something like that that had to be in the so we didn't get that and when i say we i'm not multitude <laughs> i'm not a i'm not legion <laughs> i just mean i speak we because it's my career journey is always myself and my husband okay so typically we'll do my cover letters together interesting um my profile has him painted all over it. So he would read, refine. No, no, don't do it that way. Um, so you could call him my executive coach. <laughs> free, you know. Of course, we'll fight sometimes. I won't listen to him. I won't listen. You know, I'll still come back. But so it was we, you know, the days where I'll come back, just feeling very. I remember you asked me a question how did I feel that? You know, there's some days you do the interview, you're optimistic. I remember I interviewed with OES. Um, they, what they call them? Um, what's this? Oando. They are a offshoot of, you know, Oando. Different, in fact, I had lovely brands. Mm. And that was a time when HR Storyteller was bettered. Uh. So you see, everything. If I didn't have that gap yet, I actually don't think it would have come to light. I used to write, but it was not. And how did it happen? So I used to talk a lot, chat a lot on groups, comment, I'm part of, you know, one committee or the other. And that day, I went for an interview. So there's something wrong with that process from the beginning. We're told to submit six copies of our CVs. Ah, six! <laughs> How? So that had been a red flag. Okay. So I'd written about, I just wrote six copies of CVs. What are you, you know, people will talk. People. So I noticed that people liked the way I would just drop something and respond. Anyways, fast forward to the day of the interview. I get there and I walk into the interview room. This is the most hilarious part. You know, you know me now, dress sharp and everything. And I walked into the waiting room and they were like, Close to 50 people in the room. Oh, it, get, it gets worse. And all of them just said, good good morning, ma. Uh-uh. I'm like, I came here for the same answer. <laughs> I came. So I was first shocked. Good morning. They thought you were the executive coming to interview them. <laughs> so I found out that apparently there were different roles oh. that were advertised. And different levels. So from... They were just different roles. And all of you at the same time? Uh, 50. The numbers increased. So they, used to, they gave us tally. <laughs> you, know, you pronounced it instead of tally? Tally. Because when I was in university. <laughs> okay. Union Bank. When my dad gives me a check to okay. go and collect money. It's tally number <laughs> that you collect. And... Um, <laughs> I was so but the usual part can we wait and see open mind just exactly and and that's one thing I think that a lot of people lack in mm. just open your mind so I sat there and I think I was chatting with a family group so I was telling them I'm here you know and I was chatting and then some guy taps me from the back touch he actually touched me I look back and he goes you type very fast so I'm like yeah, thank you. So I'm, 
I'm still typing. I'm still typing. And then he says, wow. So I'm like, is this guy reading what I'm writing? Gosh. And then there were different conversations. So I said writing. So basically, I said writing what was going on. So I said writing. I'm here. Some guy just tapped me. And it was at that moment. So I brought out my small book. Okay. And I just said, crafting what was happening. And I said, Kenny, you have so many stories. You love to write. You love to read. Mm. You used to write when you're younger. So I didn't call it HR Storyteller. HR Storyteller was named by other people. So the first day I got home that night after it took, it was my head was just pumping with the idea of can we just talk, just write. So I got into the interview room. There were seven people on the interview. Don't let me go into the details. It was just funny. They were recruiting different roles for a a company they wanted to open in Agbara or something. Okay. So I, I did, I followed through the process because I'm always like, I want to, so that I know what is happening. Mm-hmm. So I now started telling the stories on a HR platform and people loved it. So I used to give suspense. I just do part one, drop it. And then they're like, ah, where is the story? <laughs> so the next seminar or something I went to, Next thing everybody just kept saying, that's the HR story to like. Because oh, a lot yeah. of people didn't know me physically. They knew my name. Okay. So it was very few of my eggmores and friends. So I got there. In fact, that day was fun. I just got there. So I went to greet them and say, that's the HR storyteller. So they named me. Okay. And that's how I birthed it. So I would like to say that HR storyteller was birthed due to that gap Up here. period. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about talking about... Yes, yeah. GIG. So GIG, different environment. It was exciting. If I remember when the opportunity came, so um, someone reached out to me. They had sent my CV. A lot of that happened where headhunters were now, oh, we understand that you're not um, doing anything actively. Like, uh, yeah. So they said, GIG. I didn't know what to you know, Say, God is good. I'm like, God is good. I know them. <laughs> they do vehicles. And then... Um, my friend who had done the connect was telling me how a lot of things had changed. I always am excited by transformation. I'm always excited by something fresh. So went, met with um, the chairman, fantastic guy. And um, we connected and he wanted me to come on board and lead HR across the subsidiaries. Um, so I worked with GIG. It was interesting for me because GIG was transportation. They had subsidiary transportation. They had a subsidiary that handled logistics. They had a subsidiary that handled power, energy and power. Many people don't know that. They, are, they have a subsidiary that handles, um, 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 what do you call it? Fuel, you know, fueling. Uh, and um, Reese, before I left, launched another subsidiary that um, was into vehicles, um, making, selling vehicles. Okay. So he was making the own vehicles. Yes. Okay. One of the brands is called Jet Moto and they're doing very well now. Interesting. Um, they just launched, um, one of their vehicles is um, electric, the electric vehicle that they're partnering with GIG Logistics to use. Okay. So, that was another beautiful also remember that because of the experience I've had so GIG2 was focused a lot on software technology because they're using software to drive um, the technology that powers most of these things so it was attractive to him that I had that experience I had experience with software developers I had experience with analysis I had experience with that finance so the experience just helps me challenges or struggles um workforce um being able to hmm so this was a bigger workforce than okay. vgj how many people <laughs> at so the time i joined because something happened where we took over running delta line transportation okay um as of the time i joined we were about um 1000 plus okay by the time we took over Delta Transport, we had hit 2,000 thereabouts. Oh. 
So in terms of size of personnel, big. In terms of demography, also different because we're dealing with people. Transport and logistics are somewhat intertwined, but we're also trying to still keep the relationship, but separate that this is a business line. So there's a logistic process. It's not that because they're using the vehicles to, there are people responsible for logistics, responsible. Um, power, energy and power. Um, you know, also they do solar alternative uh, power. And then Delta Line came now. They were also coming with, were inheriting a workforce that had been run by the government. So now being run by a private company, you need to understand that dynamic, okay. the dynamics. Challenges, um, high energy, high, they bring bringing up energy today. You are at the terminal, walking and checking the buses. You are actually looking at the vehicles. You are working with the, just to have an idea of the whole business structure, the value chain. Um, there are a lot of people who also were already in the system for a while, who are used to doing things a certain way. They are trying to... Subculture. A culture realignment. Okay. Transformation. Um, some pushback sometimes from senior management personnel, but not pushback that couldn't be handled. Um, so how did you handle it? Just leveraging on one of my key skills, which is relationship management, understanding allies in the workforce, being able to navigate. People like to call it office politics, but it's Office protocol, you actually need it. Everybody, okay. politics exists everywhere. When it becomes very political, is when people think that, you know, there's some funny benefit. But you need to understand the navigation. So that was also handled as best as possible. Curiously, yeah. so before we continue, did you understand, you mentioned office politics now and navigation. You did you understand, did you have this level of understanding then at VGG? Or was it you leaving VGG Venture Garden Group that um, deepened your understanding of needing to, well, now I almost like I'm repeating myself, deepened your understanding of office politics and then it took you, then that lesson took you to um, the hmm. So there's something I, I like to say, know thyself. Okay. Um, and by knowing yourself, remain true to thyself. The things that, and that's why I don't like to use the word politics because in this side of town is misconstrued. Sure. And when you say office politics, it's always regarded as ah, yeah, so more. You are doing party, party kind of thing, but kissing ass, if ever you Yes, that. please. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> kissing ass. Um, I'm not built that way, but I'm built the way that there has to be alignment of thought. Diversity of thought exists, then there's alignment of thought. Alignment is that we understand your perspective, I understand my perspective. In VGG, yes, I was familiar with navigation, you know, and there were people who I could get to help me do something or okay. achieve something, yes. But remember that I said it was at a point when I felt that our values were okay. no more, you know, so. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think leaving an organization means. Um, it's because it's altogether bad. It's just that maybe you've outgrown the role. Maybe there's no alignment or there's a difference, a strong difference in opinion or, or approach that you feel can be done differently. So to your question, I'll say that, of course, as you grow, um, if you're deliberate, not that you feel that, oh, I knew it all. But I'll say, yes, over time, I keep understanding that there are different approaches to things, the better ways to do it, um, the better ways to talk to people, to get in them, to... Um, but there's some people that um, you can't necessarily convert because they're either familiar with a certain way or a style and they'll rather just stay in that space. So... What's one or two tips you'd share on how to... 
is it convert people or get them to align to your position? So first of all, it's not like you're going, you want to win. It's not that you're going for presidency that <laughs> you want them to, you know. Um, <clears throat> but I think depending on the level or state or growth level of the organization, because organizations have different growth level. You come into an organization, people may have been there five, six, ten years doing things a certain way. Now, is the organization just hiring you to continue the journey? Organization is bringing you to to steer the ship differently. So depending on either one, your strategy may be different. If it's just to join the, join the wagon, you're just plug and play. But if you're coming at a point where there's a lot of energy or the team that you're leading did not exist, you also know you're creating a team. So I'll say that my tips will be that, um, first of all, as a HR person or practitioner, whatever level, Especially when you're maybe senior, you know, <clears throat> or growing there, you need to understand the the organization. What is the culture? What is the desired culture? Not ah, I know this. Mm-mm. What is the culture? What is the desired culture? Once you understand that, then you understand. Now, organizations are made of formal and informal structures. Formal is organogram, policy. Informal structures are those cultural relationships. Who is who? The person that has been in the system for years, that has information. The ones that the mama and baba is saleh, cabal. <laughs> um, now, cabals can be good or bad, whichever way. Um, the, the people that know information. The ones that you should stay clear of. You understand, you need to know the dynamics. So you need to know formal. What's a formal structure? Because formal is what you as a HR person are going to work on. But the formal structure is the power that you also need to understand. How do you understand it? By talking to people. Okay. By So as a senior HR person, you have to be speaking to people at your level speaking to managers, speaking to other staff, different leaders in the company. So you're going to have chats, um, socialize, find ways to socialize, ask how you can help them, find what their pain points are. In those meetings, you'll be hearing things like, oh, oh, HR has done this, HR has done that. You Some meetings will be hearing, ah, HR, you have come, you're going to come and help us, you know. So they're different, you know, and over time, you start seeing those informal structures play up. <clears throat> At meetings, there are ways people talk. There are languages they use for you to understand the culture that exists. You're walking through the corridor, you know, maybe you're someone that, hello, how are you? And then everybody's just like, you know, so you're getting a vibe of the culture. Interesting. Those are things that, um, I, you know, so you need to understand your allies, the people in that environment, the people who... So there are names to these things. There's the bureaucratic belts. There's the tugboat pilot. This is HR buzzwords. <laughs> there is um, wind surfers. There's you know there are four categories. I'm trying to remember the fourth one. So the first person is the one that has been in the system. Just a bureaucratic. Bureaucratic belt. Okay. Um, someone who understands the system, that has information about the system, that can teach you that has legacy knowledge that's one of your best allies um tugboat pilot those ones understand the drama <laughs> they understand the informal structure they know who is who okay they know who you should hold on to mm-hmm. they understand so you know, that one understands structure overall everything these ones are now, you know, talk boat. They, they yeah, have the, the office protocol. They, they are the ones that you may miss out. They may not be senior people. Hmm. They may not be very senior people. Maybe mid level. Maybe they be their sense, but they have, they have influence. Anchor. They have influence. Okay. Um, the third person is benevolent bureaucrat. Wind yes. Sofa. Okay. Uh, yes, wind surface. I just remember okay. benevolent bureaucrat 
I hope I'm not mixing them. That that one is I can describe them more. Is the person who you you know wants to help you, but wants to know what is in it for him or her. Okay. They're also good because they can speak on your behalf. But it means you must align. You mean must need. You need to understand what, what is in it for him or her. And align what you're proposing to what the one. Fantastic. If you need that person. Okay. The fourth person is wind suffers something something is wind suffers, and this person or these people are the ones that um, they are with you when the going is good. <laughs> okay. They are almost like benevolent bureaucrats, but if that thing messes up, wind suffers are out. They are out. They may not be the best people to have around. Especially so, knowing this, having this knowledge. When you want to pitch an idea, when you want to sell an initiative, when you want to get people to follow you, you need to know, you know. In what bucket? So that's why in HR, in, in, in the competences that it requires HR, there's something called navigation. That's where all this office politics, you need to understand navigation. Interesting. You go to some companies, I'm sure you see some junior staff, but those junior staff, they're very influential. People they defend. cannot be fired. <laughs> Stuff like that. Or you talk to them and they have influence. They are the ones you should, you know, those kind of things. So I would say that understanding the um, the differences within the organization is key. In just a moment, we'll cover Kemi's lessons at GIG and her career journey onwards to TVC Communications. Stay with us. I'm Oshaye and you're listening to Origins Africa Podcast. Hi, dear listener. If you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes and Apple Podcast. You can also send us a tweet or comment on Instagram at Origins AF. We love to read from you. Nope, not later. Yes, I read your mind. Do it now. Thanks a lot. Also, click the subscribe button and share with a friend. Let's make a difference together, one origin story at a time. Catch our one-to-one newsletter where we share with you one lesson, two quotes, and one question from each episode published. You'll find it at originsafrica.substack.com originsafrica.substack.com If you like it, please click the like button, leave a comment, share with a friend, and subscribe. Also, you can now watch video snippets of some of our guest interviews. Simply go to Origins Africa Podcast on YouTube, Origins Africa Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, like our videos, and share. Let's make a difference together, one origin story at a time. Hi guys, welcome back to Origins Africa Podcast. So what lessons did Kemi learn at GIG? It's, it's still, and I, I, was, I was thinking about this, that when you said you were going to do this interview, that one of the things that appeals to me or I like across board in every brand I've worked with is that I'm proud that I worked at different places and I'm happy with the work that everybody does. Mm. GIG is poised and is still doing so many big things. Um, key lessons will be that... Um, Cultural transformation is not easy mm. and it requires a certain um, mix of skill sets, not from an individual, from different people and commitment to doing it. Mm. Um, GIG, you know, the transformation in terms of where they were coming from and the leadership to where they are now. Is phenomenal. Um, homegrown company, Nigerian company, um, no influence from the international. It's just that now they're going out. You know, it's not the other way, in, in, you know, and that is phenomenal. Um, there's nothing you can achieve there if you, if you, you know, set your mind to do it. And it's also fast paced. So it's, it's a, an older company, but has a startup type okay. nature. Okay. You know, agile, movement, you know, kind of thing. Um, keep high octane. It can change any day. 
while there's some things, some processes that are static, but there's, there's continuity, there's change. So, um, key lessons, just expanded my, my network and my net worth. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any other. When did you feel it was time to go? When it was time, no. <laughs> um, yes, in, in terms of time, it, I spent two years. So that could be said, oh, that's a short period. But um, Having spent six years at Venture Garden And group. spent all the, <laughs> I've spent years at, you know, Ex- but, at Etel and um, Co. I just think it's part of the maturity. It's part of quickly realizing that there's something else I want to do. Okay. Um, and this particular point I'm at, I'm not no more um doing I want to do more. Um then a lot of I had a lot of stress with travel time. Okay. That put a lot of pressure on me, my health. Um there are also some considered changes that are gonna happen that um I believed was not necessarily the best time for those changes. And it wasn't necessarily aligned once again with my okay. um, value system. I won't call it value system, just my career. Because, you know, to your question, when you said in the beginning, and I don't think there's any pressure on anybody, if you're not clear on the name you want to be called, or rather the, the title you want to, in the beginning, you can you can move. And then when you get to a point where you know that this is an area that I want to continue in, and I'm at that area. So, at GID, I think there was an attempt to veer, and I didn't want to veer. Okay. Uh, I wanted to continue expanding, impacting, and doing more. Okay. So, I wasn't actively looking. Okay. So, when the opportunity came, I had conversations, it sounded nice. I liked what they were doing on the other side of the divide. So I took it. Okay, and what opportunity was it? Um, I moved to TVC. Um, so once again, this was I'm coming to media. Like, yeah. you know, you've done everything. So that for me was exciting. And then it also was, I done a vision board exercise maybe 12 years ago. And one of the things I put on my vision board was um, speaking on radio working, you know, maybe having a radio station. So <laughs> when TVC was talking to me, oh, maybe, maybe, okay. because I've, I've, I've learned over time that your passion, your purpose, there's an alignment, just like how the HR storytelling aspect came up. And so I'm, I'm loving every moment of it. Now it's here, over. It was when you joined that then pandemic. Oh, started. Lord. <laughs> and <laughs> and it, God loves me. <laughs> no, you, you know, when I, I think about it, um, I joined and boom, pandemic hit. So it was a time to show up. Not show off. Show up mm-hmm. that... You can do this. You can keep the workforce because there's so much confusion. There's confusion on jobs, there's confusion on everything, sure. survival. So swung into business continuity mode. And then this was me coming into a new company, exactly. trying to understand the company. But I'm, I'm very proud of myself that um, we're still on that journey. Um, you know, last year was tough on the country, on the company, on people, and we're still trying to come out of that, if, if there's anything like coming out of it. But being able to keep the workforce energized, safe, um, productive. Because I know you're also the yes. and your yes. company getting burnt, I think. That's yes. Union, rather. Yes. Um, so we're just coming out of the lockdown, trying to understand how we're going to handle lockdown and all of that. And then um, we had an attack on our premises. Um, but we're, we're, we're getting stronger. 
day by day and um, but it's been a fantastic journey for me um, and I'm looking forward to the next phase and the next phase of when the attack happened what came to mind oh. were you in the you weren't in the building right you at him no no I was in the building that day but okay. we had staff in the building where um, I think I've not really spoken about this I'm still going to trying to articulate it. I promised myself that as when it's one year exactly, I will write how I feel. But um, to answer your question very briefly, the first thought was, God, um, let no one perish mm-hmm. in this um, fracker. So that was the first thought. That was the first process. That was what every, you know, I was on the phone, trying to get people out, trying to ensure that nobody was hurt and just get out, you know, just make sure that at the end of the day, you know, people, both our staff and even people around were not affected. So I think it's after that, that the realization that, okay, um, this has happened, what's next? But um, all of us swung into action, the resilient spirit, we never for once even, even if the, the, the back part of you felt it briefly. We never articulated that this was the end. Mm. Just said, you know, let's let's move, and we're moving. So far, um, lessons at um, TVC. That's ongoing. I'm with TVC, and I'm enjoying every moment of it. Um, I have a beautiful workforce. Um, mixed demography, older people, young people. High energy because of the environment, news, entertainment, radio, um, Nigerian company, and we're doing fantastic. Um, the sky, they say, as the sky, as they say, is the, you know, we're still moving. Um, TBC gives content both on digital, terrestrial, when DSTV, <clears throat> and local TV, Star Times, Go TV. Um, our radio channels in Lagos, we're in Abuja and in Adaba, Adaba FM. Um, lessons so far is the resilient spirit of the Nigerian person. I've seen it and I can bank on it, especially with what we went through last year. Recovering or trying to recover from a COVID and then going through um, something as dramatic as your premises being, you know, attacked. So um, lessons will be that there's nothing anybody can't do. I've always said that, and I see it play out every day. Um, Lessons will be that the team that I took over leading there's been phenomenal change as evident in people's feedback, both all the levels from where it was and where it is now, um, which also reiterates that you're doing something right. You've been doing it well, keep at it. Um, lessons would be keep building those skills that I've been building all the years, keep navigating, um, keep pushing through, Lessons for me also over the years, not just here, is be consistent, you know, and challenge yourself. Don't um, shy away from that challenge. There's something that is coming that is bigger that you can take. So that's why when people talk about imposter syndrome, is because I've, with the right tools, been able to do what I set my hat on, my eyes on, and sometimes even do what I did not see coming. But it comes and I'm like, okay, can we jump at it? So consistency has always been, um, you know, and then just be humble, remain humble. Humility comes with um, its own, you know, some people may try to take advantage of being humble, but you find out that you get more from being humble. People are attractive to 
to humility. You know, um, stay hungry. You know, I always say that. And hunger is not a uh, palliative dance. Is that um, you're hungry to learning. You're, you're hungry to understanding that there's a new perspective. You're hungry for more. And that's why I would have even been able to play across different um, spaces. I, in fact, when you told me you're doing this interview, I had a funny feeling that I'm not retiring now. <laughs> you know, this feeling like I'm not retiring. I actually even feel that I have just started, honestly. I, I actually feel that you don't feel, I know, because there are some other things in my heart that I know that I want to do, I want to explore within HR. Across board. Like. So much. HR is moving these days. Future of work is here. We're talking about future of work. Diversity and inclusion, not many companies are going to have a clue as to the breadth of diversity and inclusion. Um, corporate governance, there's so much in that bucket. Even though corporate governance sometimes tilts to some other teams, honey, but it's a HR uh, functionality. Um, analytics is something you, you've always known. I love, you know, numbers and everything. Um, and who says that I may not be able to write a code? I said that recently, something <laughs> I, I want to play around. I want to try and see if I can code. And in the space I'm in, radio, I've said it. If I remember when I was interviewing, my boss said, voice. I said, yeah, <laughs> I know. They tell me I have a radio voice. So maybe, maybe I could start, okay. you know, just asking them that maybe I should come and one day in the week, just be mm. talking on radio. I'm maybe getting this HR ministry mm. on the road. Um, so there's so much more. I, I and that's why I was trying to like, say this is up, you know. But I do believe that there's so much I'm going to do. I'm positioned to doing. There's so much I want to achieve, and I'm conscious that I want to influence as many people as is possible. And that's it. Was there imposter syndrome at any point in time? Hmm. So. You know, for people that don't know imposter syndrome, because <laughs> she has just come to use big words for you. Imposter syndrome is that, am I good enough? Yes. To uh, do the moments where you felt maybe you weren't good enough or you had been given so much that you couldn't handle it. Oh, hmm. Ah, this question. So, um, I remember very clearly the day I was in a meeting. And um, so, this was at the phase where money had come in, investments had started happening, some changes had started happening, some roles were expanded, we had hired new roles. That these young guys that came, you know, they had redefined the work structure. And um, so a lot, there was a lot of changes going on that was beginning to show some differences in opinion across the different levels. People who had been in the system longer, some people who were handling bigger portfolios and all of that. So when that meeting was a management meeting and um, the organogram was being presented and this organogram had been worked on, not by HR at that time, but by the office of the CEO and the CEO, so the personnel who worked in the office of CEO. And they were showing a snapshot of the company structure at the senior level. And the HR team that I was heading was um, being broken up or something and recategorized. Okay. And um, so I saw my name not in the position that usually in the leadership corporate head position it was a different bucket it was very it wasn't clear and it was your first time seeing it i was seeing it the first time. and uh, but i guess all my acting skills from paid off. Paid off. <laughs> so I, was, I went into blank mode but i was confused because i didn't understand so i when i said i didn't understand the, the tempo in the company had been changing, but I didn't understand what that was about. Um, so I went, after the meeting, went to the office. Um, 
I walked up to, I went to meet my CEO and I asked him that mm -hmm. I wasn't clear on um, what was happening. And I remember that that meeting was a very different meeting. He wasn't looking at me, he couldn't look at me properly. You know, it felt different. Um, you know, when they say what is said and what's not being said. Um, and then he just said something along the lines, oh, you know, the company is changing. Now we had collected money, you know, the investment that we all worked on. And if the company is changing, there's growth. I understood that. And with that comes new responsibilities. Um, so it's like, you know, just stretch me, um, wants me to, you know, give myself like a six month timeline um, to see how much more I can do. Uh, because, you know, once we are at the level of, you know, <laughs> Coca-Cola director kind of HR. That's I remember that was one of the things he said. And um, so the feedback I was getting was, I need more from you. The feedback I was getting was, you're not doing enough. Um, feedback I was getting was, I'm looking for somebody else if you don't step up. That's the feedback. I got, I got um, back to my office. I remember going into the bathroom, I cried because I didn't understand what was happening. Yeah, you know. So at that moment, I questioned my competency. Mm -hmm. At that moment, that what was happening? Luckily, once again, access to different people and um, I remember speaking, of course, the first person I usually would talk to is my husband. And my husband would tell you, no, you? And it's not from, you know how your husband or your spouse just says, ah, you are the best. Mm -mm. He would reassure me with facts. He would remind me of things I had done. Mm. He would reaffirm in my moments of doubt mm. that you did this, you did this, you did this. Is there room for growth? Oh, yes. I spoke to one of my mentors who coincidentally had come to work with us then on some projects. We still have a fantastic relationship today. And I asked him questions. He referred me to go meet um, the then um, she head of HR for Sahara. Just to talk to her. You know, you know sometimes you need to bounce up ideas have a feel, you know, maybe the things you could do differently. We had an extended talk. She had a, her recommendations. Not all of them did I, you know, take and all of that. And at that point, I said, you know what, Kemi, do something in this your normal learning phase. Don't, don't dwell. Keep doing what you're doing, but use it as an opportunity to rechallenge yourself. And that's when... Um, Econel, I took up the strategic course, okay. the certification rather, with Econel. So I dug my head, not in the sand, into refining and redefining because I realized then with that tempo, with that feedback, it was painful feedback. I would, I still talk about it. Um, in fact, I think I just said talking about it maybe two years, three years. But it was painful feedback because I, I didn't see it coming. We'd had performance reviews, so I would have expected that if there's specific things the I should look out like for, that. it wasn't talk, we didn't talk about it. And um, it almost seemed like I was being served the shorter end of the stick. But in retrospect, now again, um, those are things that if it didn't happen, there were revalidations I needed to make with myself that I did because of that conversation. I'm not sure that was intention. Maybe the person didn't see it coming that this thing is not going to pull her down. If anything, it made me just say, you know, Kemi, you need to keep building. You need to keep upskilling. You, but that I can't do it. No. But in truth, at that point, those few days, I felt maybe I'm not, 
Are you sure that I'm, I'm good enough? But after that, no. Would because, you say that was your... <clears throat> that was the moment you felt... Maybe that was the point you were at your lowest in your career or it wasn't, there was some other moment? Um, that... I think that was it. Because the shock of... You know... First of all, a conversation that happened without you being involved, that speaks a lot. Then the conversation happened and even though everybody in the room was... You could, you could see from the looks on the faces of everybody in the room, there was shock. <clears throat> Not even just for me, there are some other things, but largely, and I, you know, but I, I just did this poker face. I can't forget that day. So I was like, ah, Kemi, these are drama skills. I just switched off. So from the sides, you know, you have to have chicken bread view. I could see people mm. looking. What's she going to do? Reaction. Exactly. But... That was one of my best moments. I was calm. I didn't even twitch. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't move. I just sat down very calmly. I have friends that were in that room that still talk about <laughs> that moment. You know, that's to say, because it took a lot not to react, not to be saying, ah, you know, what, what, what can for? You know, I just, I just calmly. It took a lot, mm. you know. Even remembering it now, I didn't. It was there were emotions. There was rage. There was pain. There was confusion. There was disappointment. Not in myself. In the time I'd seen that spent, then there was doubt that maybe the lens I'm looking at myself through is not the lens other people. I'm looking at so you could you call it imposter syndrome i don't like to use that imposter syndrome seems like a as i used i needed to clarify because i'm using big english but you know um so yes i'll say that was one of i remember coming home and i cried ah, i've cried a lot to my son tries you know well, well you know I, and i think it's also the hr space hr takes a lot from you because you're dealing with all sorts Oh, I just remembered, not low moments, but one of my, the first time I had to terminate the mm. staff. Oh, my Lord. Ha. Ah, but now, <laughs> it's not like, how do I say it? Let me not say now. It's yeah. not a good thing, you know. But it's, it's better now. But that first time, and the first time there were people that I'd worked with, that are trained. I cannot forget the night before, I didn't sleep. Butterflies, all the animals in animal kingdom were in my stomach. I went to the toilet many times. I couldn't sleep. I'm going to sack someone. I'm going to. This person's going to leave this company. That, that was the first time I questioned HR. Hey, Are you sure you can? You know, because I'm usually I just, but I actually quickly did everything. I I did. I announced when I knew that. Before then, I used to talk about documentation. You know, I always want things done properly. I knew that for you to let go of a staff, you need to be sure that you've done everything properly. And then I made sure that the exit conversation, even though very painful, I made sure that I did it as humanely possible. And the people that let go of, as we talk. There's so many of them in the course of my career. We talk till tomorrow. We moved on to do other things. And I remember receiving messages where people say, thank you for making it less uncomfortable. Of course, there's circumstances. If the one that uh, maybe people fraudulent, we don't talk, or, you know, <laughs> they've gone. Um, but that was not a low moment, but back to so there were all sorts of emotions I, I experienced that day um, um, where it, it was it was almost like, you know, when you're sleeping and somebody pour, pours ice water. But I kept calm. I went to cry in the toilet. Go home to my husband. I said, something is off. Something's not working. Or he re, reaffirmed. He always does that. You can do this. You got this, so to speak. 
and um, yeah. What has getting to where you are today cost you? What has it cost me? Yes. What price have you had to pay? What did you need to give up? For instance, what did you need to sacrifice? I paid money to write exams, certifications, knowledge. And it's not money that maybe the company pays. It's an investment in myself because the best investment for me is me. Because it's when I am equipped, I am a better tool, I can add value. Costs me maybe more sleep. I don't sleep because I'm working. I'm thinking, well, I sleep. <laughs> I maybe just don't sleep as much as I might sleep. Cost me um, the times on some job or jobs where I think that um, my health suffered because I, I'm always, you know, I'm just so move, you know, and then I have to be reminded that you need to slow down. But I've not lost anything. If anything, I've gained over the years. I keep gaining. I gain friendships. I gain um, relationships, very healthy relationships, connections. And this is not, I'm going for presidency tomorrow once again, but healthy connections that I'm able to talk to people, ask for help and do the same. People reach out to me. They want me to advise. They want me to recommend. They want me to mentor. They want me to coach. Those things, don't, I don't take those things for granted because it's not my doing. It's just that God has put me in that position and equipped me to be able to serve people. So I have not lost anything. I will go again. I have a beautiful family and um, supportive husband. My daughter too supports me with different <laughs> things. Way. Yes. <laughs> and you'd be surprised. She reads my stories and she's always like, okay, mm. I like that, you know? And then in our way, it gives me more stories to tell. Mm. Um, I have a very good support system, family, extended family. I have a, a nanny that has been with us for years. She's, she's more like family already because I needed that balance to be able to keep growing. So days I couldn't come home early, days I had to be in meetings till late. She, she and other people stood in the gap. So I've not lost anything. What did you learn the hard way? This one, you know, this question asking is like those questions you ask people at interview when they're looking for work. <laughs> I'm not looking for work. So I don't think I've ever yeah, answered this Jeremy. question. <laughs> so what did you learn the hard way? Hard way. <sighs> it's a how do I say it? I don't I don't I don't want to say it's hard, but that you just have to work for what you want. I don't think that's learning it the hard way. You just have to put in time to get what you want. Mm -hmm. I remember some of my dissertations, exams, things I had to submit, especially at eConnell. And then you're working with uh, a school in New York. So time slots and all those things you have to submit. The days I couldn't, I have to take extra time just to submit those things. Because once you don't do it, you failed. <laughs> Learn the hard way. Um, oh, um, that there are some relationships that you know that you need to define some relationships early on. My nature, my kind of person, I mean, open to all kind of person, but I've had to learn that not everybody really wants that kind of relationship. And I, have to, I had to learn that the few friendships or friends I have, I keep them there. Um, so to your question, it would be that I learned, I saw a different type of relationship that has formed my understanding that not every relationship will be the same formed my understanding that there are people you have transactional relationships with and it should be okay um, as long as you're cordial 
I think that was, that's one of the things that I look back on and I'm like, I learned it the hard way because I gave a bit of myself or too much of myself. But luckily I was able to, without going too far, and I learned from it. Mm, okay. What do you know now? And you wish you had known when you started your HR career? No. Oh, wow. Hi. Um, I know things every day. I'm learning every day. Um, when I started my HR career, I think that it was all hands on deck. I went. I took on a lot at once. Yes, yes, yes. I took on a lot at once. I wanted to do everything. I wanted to be everything. When I say do everything, I say fix all the problems. And then you find out that something else suffers in the process. Or it's slipping through, you know, it's like when you're trying to carry so many balls in two hands, there's so much your two hands can carry. So I'll try everything and find out that, you know, I need more energy, physical energy, mental energy. But now there's still room for improvement. But now I see that I can... I realized that do what you can now. Clean up, tidy up, finish that before you move on to the next thing. Okay. Some of those things are connected. Some of those things, they're like a loop system. So you need to even understand, you know, they see the end from the beginning. As against trying to do so many things at once. So taking a step back also to realize that I can't do everything. Or maybe there's a pace to doing everything. Mm. There's a style. There's an approach, and I've, I've, that's a better frame for me now, so that I don't burn out, so that I don't um, burn out mentally, burn out physically, and that you can actually influence more. How do you unwind? Oh, ah, uh, uh, dance, hang out with my girls, take wine, <laughs> take suya. We go do sleepovers. We love to dance once again. Um, go try out new food. We used to go hiking until last year, COVID. Um, I ride my bicycle. I unwind. Oh, you have a bicycle? Of course, I have a bicycle. My daughter I has a bicycle. Miss her. I have a bicycle. <laughs> How did I know that? Are you serious? <laughs> Are you for real? I ride. I posted a video of me and Iri on our bikes. Instagram? Or what's Jones. the story? Was, no, Instagram story. Story. Yeah. Okay. I probably um, Interesting. I walk. Okay. Yeah. I and then that. I love to listen to a lot of music. So in the morning, um, music, if I'm walking or running, I used to run a lot before, but my knees are not as strong as before. So I walk and I wear my leg brace. Um, I just, just enjoy life as much as you can. Fun moments, spend time with family. Um, I always want to go out on a date with my husband. I wish we need to. We need to do more of that, this man. <laughs> um, take my daughter out, you know, and just generally just let life, you know, travel. COVID. Yeah. I love traveling, um, shopping, <laughs> and of course, seeing new places. And uh, yeah. Looking back through the years. Would you ascribe your achievements or successes, if you want to call it that, to your hard work, your skills and talents, or to luck? Luck. Okay, I, I know that there's luck okay. somehow, but I'm not a, oh, I, lucky any, no, 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 no. I, I believe that, which is why I use the word consistency, First of all, there's God factor in my, I, I never for once doubt that God is a key, is the architect, yeah. and he's the one building this story, this, you know, um, hard work, of course, um, trusting that I have what it takes to do what I want to do. And of course, being guided by God on what I require, the skills I need. The strong, the second strong um, pillar is my husband, it's my family. Um, because I look back and I'm like, if I don't, if I didn't have this type of person in my life, mm -mm, I may have 
not even trusted myself as much as I, I do. You know, just keeps, it's like when somebody keeps holding you. So um, hard work, consistency, all those things, great. They come in. I'm not going to say it's luck. Luck has its own, it's there, but it's being deliberate. It's being, believing in yourself, believing that God has your back and is in charge. And those are the things that would, yeah. Advice to listeners. Hmm. I don't know. Beautiful listeners. Um, I, I know that there's a demography, different demography that will be listening to this. And I know that we're in an age that um, it's no more necessarily hard work that is considered successful. Um, you know, when you see people, people see you. I remember a young man your years back talking to me about getting married <clears throat> and he was downcast. And I said, ah, what's wrong with you? And he goes, ah, you know, he wanted to get married. He didn't have a car then. And he went into detail. So I was looking at him. And I said, does a car qualify who you are for this marriage? I said, ah, you know, now I have to, I said, no, no. Have you, you know, answer my question. And he answered. I said, when I married, it was just a vehicle between myself and my husband. I said, I know now, HR. This can't be, you know, see, you're a big woman. And I told him, I said, big woman, don't be deceived. Everything is God's grace. It is time. So for me, a lot of people now, and this is another conversation I had yesterday where we were talking about, someone was venting to me about the number of women. You remember we've had this conversation, women in tech, you know, and he went into detail saying that some of the young ladies, the focus is different. Everybody's thinking about finishing school and selling hair, selling face products. It's not like it's bad, but it does seem that it's the short-term fix everybody's looking for. There's no growth. There's no patience. You're not actively, you asked me questions in the beginning when I said, it's not like it was clear. I didn't have a aha moment but i was enjoying the journey and while i wasn't coasting i was learning i was growing so when sometimes people read my profile to me honestly i look back and i'm like is that me not from me i didn't do it but oh it's time has passed oh i did that you've asked me questions today that and i'm like wow that happened so it's believing in yourself so my, my tips would be believe in yourself to not necessarily take a gamble on yourself, but trust that you can do anything you set your mind to do. Put in the work. It pays off. Sometimes we're just in a hurry. We're just looking for that quick buck. Success does not necessarily mean quick, mo plenty money. Success is what have you done? What are you doing? How much more are you doing? What are you impacting? Um, my lesson also would be that as you're building technical skills or competencies, also build behavioral because there's a point where it's like two balls, you're juggling it. And as you progress, you need both. Now, one more than the other at different stages. And when you are lacking, you find out that it makes you feel um, like you failed. It takes you to that place where you begin to doubt yourself. So build competencies, build skills, not because you want an employer to say you have 20 certifications, not that. Those competencies, it's like when you are reading a story, you are ingesting the information so you can build the final, you know, you get to the crescendo and you're like, oh, it's all those things that made up the final. Um, that would be it for me. Just, I really want more people in Nigeria to thrive few people are doing that entrepreneurs you have new people starting up the people actually working hard building careers and now more than ever things are it's not like before that your career path seemed to be very thin now there's so many things you can do now there's the gig economy where you can actually even have five four three jobs depending on what you want out of it and just keep learning because this brain there's no capacity to what you can take so that would be advice my. to those who want to um, go into the HR space. 
oh, it's a fun place. Um, not because it is HR. Because we would like to say HR from a power place. It's not that. But it's fun that you actually have the, lack of a better word, the power to influence. You have the power to affect. You have the power to impact and change both organizational help frame organizational goals, individual goals, team goals. Um, what it just requires is you having the courage because it's a job that requires a dance. You balance staff, balance employees with management and you have to keep on balancing. It's a fun career, especially if you have the right merge of personality, attitude, skills to grow in that space. Do you think it's necessary to call out the skills? You said as long as they have the right merge of personality, attitude, um, skills. So how do I say it? It's not like, maybe maybe that was not the best way to frame it. Um, okay. Well, different. We come with a mix of personality, um, largely our personalities differ, you know, but to a large extent, what I'm trying to say is that success in HR or joy in HR, maybe not success. Cause I've met some HR people that I'm like, this person doesn't seem to have what it takes to be a, a good HR person mm. or maybe not person, just an effective HR leader. And I think sometimes is that, okay, I'm just doing this job. Like some other people, maybe you go into banking. Some people are not necessarily the best bankers. So I'll think that it's, it's just a combination of knowing your why. Okay. I think that's better. Why are you here? Why is this important to you? Knowing your, who are your um, customers? How do you serve them? Do you understand that you're in a job to serve? And when I say serve, not at the detriment of yourself. Do you understand the balance that you play with being? Because if you don't have that personality to balance well, you struggle as a HR person. You know, business managers or business development or salespeople, they are skewed a certain way. Bring you understand? Money. Go make sense. Exactly. Finance, they're skewed a certain way. Technical. You know, you understand what I'm saying, but HR is one of the only professions in an organization that has to keep holding both sides and not letting it tilt. So it's going to keep doing this, but you can't at any point do this. So if you know that you are not objective, taking into account different perspectives or you have the ability to. A friend of mine used to say, um, she doesn't know how I have the emotional bandwidth because there's sometimes there's some conversations that you have that take a lot from you. Especially if you're maybe somebody who has practiced HR across the different spectrums. Some people who are specialists in a field may veer off not you know, playing in that. But if you're a generalist or maybe a business partner type model, someone who's overseeing all the functions, you have to play that space. So those are the things for me that anybody going into HR, of course, you can learn them. Especially in the junior, you know, you can learn them, you can be groomed and then being deliberate about areas you want to groom yourself in and taking, you know, specific um, lessons in those areas. HR practitioners in Nigeria, what do you think they need to do more and less of? Understand the business. That's they need to do more of. Okay. A lot more people need to understand the business. It's not HR and the company. It's HR in the company. Okay. So you need to understand the business so that you can support the business properly. So that you can have a seat. When people say yeah, HR doesn't have a seat, you can have a seat at the table. You can have a voice to speak. For you to understand the business, it means you must align HR with the business. So it means all the practice, all the procedures, all those things we do must be aligned 
you cannot be in a company where they are positioning themselves as a player, maybe the number one player in that industry. And what it means is that your staff, you must have top of the range staff, you must have top of the range personnel, and you're lagging behind in your recruitment efforts. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So you must do more of that, understand the business. Most CEOs, that's their frustration, that it seems as a disconnect. Understand the business means that your employee engagement initiatives must match the model that that company requires. It means that if your teams need training, you must be training not just for the fun of it, but in line with the business. Okay. They should do more of that. Less of what? Um, less of... Ah, I've told my CEO, he does not understand. Okay. Um, not pushing with fact. Okay. They need to do less of pushing with heart. Mm. The heart is good, but do you have the data to support it? They need to do less of just being um, more tactical. Well, no, well, do more of rather. So they need to do less of um, the the conversations that my CEO doesn't get to me. The truth is you meet different people that you work with, but just being able to take yourself and say, how do I get the CEO to understand me? How do I get the senior management team to buy into this idea? How do I sell this idea? Who do I need to get to sell the idea? You understand? They need to do less of being, feeling that, they are above everybody in the organization because I've met a couple of people like that where people are scared of each other. No, that shouldn't be structured. If you were in my shoes, what is shoes are you in? question you'd have asked yourself that I haven't asked you yet. There's no question. <laughs> you have asked me all the questions <laughs> that I did not even plan that you will ask me. I'm not in your shoes. <laughs> I cannot walk in your shoe. I wear size 42. I wear kokole, 42. Your kokolo leg I is 41 and a half. Apparently. <laughs> we don't wear the same size. Who would you like me to interview next? Mm, Chidi Ajayre. Exactly. My former boss. Yes. Fantastic story. I'll be curious to have him. That's Kemi Shunobi. She's the Director of People, Culture, Experience and Operations at TVC Communications and also the founder of the HR Storyteller platform. Thank you for listening to our show this week. If you liked it, do leave us a review, a comment and share with your friends. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend and to tell another friend. We would also love to read from you. So please do send us a tweet or leave a comment on Instagram at Origins AF. You can also write to us at Origins Africa Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, do subscribe at wherever you get your podcast. Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, amongst others. Catch our one-to-one newsletter where we share with you one lesson, two quotes, and one question from each episode published. you find it at originsafrica.substack.com. Originsafrica.substack.com. And of course, if you like it, please click the like button, leave a comment, share with a friend, and don't forget to subscribe. I'm Oshaya, and you've been listening to Origins Africa podcast. Bye for now. My father told me life is not a bit of